the twenty-second voyage. I have my hands full now, sorting out all the curiosities I brought back from my voyages to the remotest corners of the universe. I had decided some time ago to donate the whole collection, the only one of its kind, to our museum. Just the other day, the curator told me he was setting aside a special room for it. Not all the items are equally precious to me. Some awaken cheerful memories, others bring to mind events full of dread and menace. But all, regardless, are evidence, full corroboration, of the authenticity of my adventures. Among the exhibits that rouse particularly strong emotions in me is a tooth. Placed on a small cushion beneath a bell glass, it has two large roots and is completely healthy. I lost it at a reception given by Mandibus, ruler of the Gnelts from the planet Apoptofa. The food they served there was excellent, but incredibly hard. No less an important place in my collection is occupied by a pipe, broken into two unequal parts. It fell from the rocket while I was cruising over a rocky sphere in the star system of Pegasus. Regretting the loss, I spent a day and a half searching cliffs and chasms in the heart of that wilderness of stone. A little farther on, in a tiny box, lies a pebble no larger than a pea. Its story is most unusual. When I set out for Ziff, the farthermost star in the twin nebulae NGC 887, I nearly overestimated my strength. The journey dragged on so long I was close to collapse. What oppressed me especially was homesickness for Earth, and I paced the rocket, unable to rest. Lord knows how this would have ended. But then, on the 268th day of the journey, I felt something digging into the heel of my left foot. I removed the shoe and, with tears in my eyes, shook out a pebble, a grain of genuine terrestrial gravel. They must have fallen in there, back at the airport, when I had walked up the steps to the rocket. Holding to my breast this minuscule but oh-so-precious particle of my native planet, I flew on to my destination with spirits lifted. That memory is particularly dear to me. And over here, resting on a velvet pillow, is an ordinary brick fired from clay, yellow-pink in color, a little cracked and also chipped at one end. Had it not been for a lucky coincidence in my own presence of mind, I might never have returned, on account of it, from the nebula of the hunting dogs. This brick I usually took with me on trips to the coldest regions of space. As a rule, I would place it for a while in the atomic engine, then put it nice and warm into my bed before turning in for the night. In the upper left quadrant of the Milky Way, there where the stellar cloud of Orion joins with the constellation of the Archer, I witnessed, while flying at low velocity, a collision of two enormous meteors. The sight of that fiery explosion in the void so excited me that I reached for the towel in order to dab my forehead, completely forgetting that earlier I had wrapped the brick in it, and lifting my hand in a rapid sweep came within an inch of smashing my own skull. Fortunately, with my usual quick-wittedness, I became aware of the danger in time. Next to the brick stands a small wooden chest. In it rests my penknife, a companion of many journeys. Just how attached I am to it, let the following story show, a story that certainly bears telling. I left Satelline at two in the afternoon with an awful runny nose. The local physician, to whom I went, recommended its amputation, a procedure that is routine for the inhabitants of the planet, since their noses grow back like fingernails. Discouraged, I went straight from his office to the airport, to fly to some sector of the heavens where medical science was more advanced. On this voyage, everything went wrong. Right at the start, when I had pulled out from the planet a mere 900,000 miles, I heard the call signal of some rocket, so I inquired by radio who was flying there. In answer, I received the very same question. I asked first, I snapped, irritated by the stranger's lack of manners. I asked first, replied the other. This mimicry was so provoking that I told the unknown traveler exactly what I thought of his impertinence. He paid me back in the same coin. We began to quarrel more and more heatedly, till after twenty minutes of this, indignant to the extreme, I suddenly realized there was no other rocket there at all, that the voice I heard was simply an echo of my own radio signals, bouncing off the surface of Satelline's moon, which I was just then passing. I hadn't noticed it before, because its night side was facing me. An hour or so later, wishing to peel myself an apple, I discovered that my penknife was missing. I immediately tried to recall where I'd seen it last, Yes, the snack bar at the Satelline Airport. I had placed it on the slanting counter. It must have slipped off and fallen to the floor in the corner. I visualized the place so well, I could have found the thing with my eyes shut. I turned the rocket around, and now a new problem arose. The whole sky was alive with twinkling lights, and I had no idea of where to look for Satelline. It is one of 1,480 spheres orbiting the sun Erysipelas. Not only that, but the majority of these have several dozen moons apiece and moons as large as planets, which makes it even more difficult to get one's bearings. Nonplussed, I tried raising Satelline by radio. In reply, a score of stations responded, all talking at once, which resulted in terrible cacophony. The inhabitants of the Erysipelan system, you have to understand, are as disorganized as they are polite, 
and they happened to have given the name Satelline to at least two hundred different planets. I looked out the window at the myriad pinpoints of light. On one of them was my penknife, but it would have been easier finding a needle in a haystack than the right planet in that interstellar anthill. At last I trusted to Lady Luck and made for the planet that lay straight ahead. Less than fifteen minutes later, I sat down at the airport. It was exactly like the one from which I'd blasted off at two. Delighted at my good fortune, I proceeded directly to the snack bar. Imagine my disappointment when, after the most painstaking search, I failed to find my penknife. With a little thought, I reached the conclusion that either someone had taken it, or else I was on an altogether different planet. Questioning the natives, I soon learned that the second supposition was correct. I was on Andragon, an old, dilapidated wreck of a planet, which should have been taken out of circulation long ago, but no one bothers with it, for it lies far off the main rocket lanes. At the port they asked me which satelline I wanted, since those spheres are numbered. Only now did I find myself at a loss, for the number had flown right out of my head. Meanwhile, notified by the airport management, the local authorities showed up in order to extend to me a formal welcome. This was a great day for the Andragonians. In all the schools, final examinations were just now being held. One of the government representatives inquired if I would care to honor the proceedings with my presence. Since I had been received with exceptional hospitality, I could hardly refuse this request. So then, straight from the airport we went by Werbel, large legless amphibians, similar to snakes, widely used for transportation, to the city. Having presented me to the assembled youths and to the instructors as an eminent guest from the planet Earth, the government representative left the hall forthwith. The instructors had me sit at the head of the plystrum, a kind of table, whereupon the examination in progress was resumed. The pupils, excited by my presence, stammered at first and were extremely shy, but I reassured them with a cheerful smile, and when I whispered the right word now to this one, now to that, the ice was quickly broken. They answered better and better towards the end. At one point there came before the examining board a young Andragonian, overgrown with ruddocks, a kind of oyster used for clothing, the loveliest I had seen in quite some time, and he began to answer the questions with uncommon eloquence and poise. I listened with pleasure, observing that the level of science here was high indeed. Then the examiner asked, Can the candidate for graduation demonstrate why life on earth is impossible? With a little bow, the youth commenced to give an exhaustive and logically constructed argument, in which he proved irrefutably that the greater part of earth is covered with cold, exceedingly deep waters, whose temperature is kept near zero by constantly floating mountains of ice. That not only the poles, but the surrounding areas are a place of perpetual bitter frost, and that for half a year there, night rains uninterrupted. That, as one can clearly see through astronomical instruments, the land masses, even in the more temperate zones, are covered for many months each year by frozen water vapor, known as snow, which lies in a thick layer upon both hills and valleys. That the great moon of Earth causes high tides and low, which have a destructive, erosive effect. That with the aid of the most powerful spyglasses, one can see how very often large patches of the planet are plunged in shadow, produced by an envelope of clouds that in the atmosphere fierce cyclones, typhoons, and storms abound, all of which, taken together, completely rules out the possibility of the existence of life in any form. And if, concluded the young Andragonian, in a ringing voice, beings of some sort were ever to try landing on earth, they would suffer certain death, being crushed by the tremendous pressure of its atmosphere, which at sea level equals one kilogram per square centimeter, or 760 millimeters in a column of mercury. This thorough reply met with the general approval of the board. Overcome with astonishment, I sat for the longest while without stirring, and it was only when the examiner had proceeded to the next question that I exclaimed, Forgive me, worthy Andragonians, but... Well, it is precisely from Earth that I come. Surely you do not doubt that I am alive, and you heard how I was introduced to you. An awkward silence followed. The instructors were deeply offended by my tactless remark, and barely contained themselves. The young people, who are not as able to hide their feelings as adults, regarded me with unconcealed hostility. Finally, the examiner said coldly, By your leave, Sir Stranger, but are you not placing too great demands upon our hospitality? Are you not content with your most royal reception, with the fanfares, the tokens of esteem? Have we not done enough by admitting you to the high plaistrum of graduation? Is this still insufficient, and you wish us, in addition, to change entirely for you the school program? But, but Earth is in fact inhabited, I muttered, embarrassed. If such were the case, the examiner said, looking at me as if I were transparent, that would constitute an anomaly of nature. 
These words I took as an affront to my native planet, and therefore left at once without a word to anyone. Got on the first Werbel I saw, and drove to the airport, where, shaking the dust of Andragon from my shoes, I blasted off to continue my search for the penknife. In this way I landed, one by one, on five planets of the Lindenblad group, on the spheres of the Stereoptops and the Malatians, on seven great bodies of the planetary family of the sun Cassiopeia, and I visited Osterilla, Aventura, Meltonia, Laternida, all the arms of the great spiral nebula in Andromeda, the systems of Plysiomachus, Gastroclantius, Eutrema, Semenophora, and Peralbab. The following year I made a systematic search of the vicinities of all the stars of Sapona and Egonalem, not to mention the spheres Erythrodonia, Arenoidium, Eodotus, Artinuri, and Glogon, with all its eighty moons, some so small you barely had room to park a rocket. On the little bear I couldn't land. They were taking inventory just then. Then on to the Cepheids and Ardenids. I threw up my hands in despair when, by accident, I landed a second time on Lindenblad. But I didn't give up, and, as befits a true explorer, forged ahead. Three weeks later I noticed a planet remarkably similar to old Satelline. My heart beat faster as I circled it in a narrowing spiral. Hard as I looked, however, there was no sign of that airport. I was about to turn back into the vastness of space when I caught sight of a tiny figure gesturing to me from below. Shutting off the engine, I quickly glided down and brought the vehicle to rest near a group of picturesque cliffs on which there rose a sizable building made of stone. Running across a field to meet me came a stalwart old man in the white frock of a Dominican monk. This was, as it turned out, Father Lassimon, the superior of all the missions active throughout the neighboring constellations within a radius of six hundred light-years. This region numbers roughly five million planets, of which two million four hundred thousand are inhabited. Father Lassimon, upon learning what had brought me to these parts, expressed his sympathy, but also his delight at my arrival, since, as he told me, I was the first man he had seen in seven months. So accustomed have I become, he said, to the ways of the Miadrasites who live on this planet, that I constantly catch myself making this particular mistake. When I wish to listen carefully, I lift my hands thus, as they do. The Miadrasites, as everyone knows, have their ears beneath their arms. Father Lassimon proved to be a gracious host. Together we sat down to a meal made up of local dishes, stuffed booch, waffles in gnussert, morchmel mumbo, and for dessert, pidgeys, the best I had had in quite some time, after which we retired to the veranda of the mission. The lilac sun warmed us, the pterodactyls with which the planet teemed sang in the bushes, and in the stillness of the afternoon the venerable prior of the Dominicans began to tell me of his troubles— he complained of the difficulties faced by missionary work in that area. The Quinquinamarians, for example, the inhabitants of Torrid Antelina, who freeze at 600 degrees Celsius, don't even want to hear of heaven, whereas descriptions of hell awaken them a lively interest, and this because of the favorable conditions that obtain there, bubbling tar, flames. Moreover, it is unclear which of them may enter the priesthood, for they have five separate sexes, not an easy problem for the theologians. I expressed my sympathy. Father Lassiman shrugged. That is not the half of it. The hoods, for instance, consider rising from the dead an act as commonplace as putting on one's clothes, and absolutely refuse to accept the phenomenon as a miracle. The Sassids of Igilia, they have no arms or legs. They could cross themselves with their tails, but I cannot make any decision on this myself. I'm waiting for an answer from the Apostolic See. It's been two years now, and still the Vatican says nothing. And did you hear of the sad fate that befell poor Father Oribezi of our mission? I shook my head. Listen, then, and I will tell you. Even the first discoverers of Afoptofa could not find praises enough for its inhabitants, the mighty Gnelts. The consensus is that these intelligent beings are among the most obliging, kind, peaceable, and altruistically inclined creatures in the entire universe. Thinking, therefore, that such soil would be ideal to plant the seed of the faith, we sent Father Orobesi to the Gnelts, naming him Bishop Impartibus Infidelium. Arriving at Afoptofa... He was received in such a way that one could hardly ask for more. They lavished on him motherly solicitude, respect, hung on his every word, read the expressions on his face, and instantly carried out his least request. They drank in the sermons he delivered. In short, they submitted to him completely. In the letters he wrote to me, he could not find words enough to praise them, unfortunate man. Here the Dominican priest wiped a tear from his eye with the sleeve of his frock. In this propitious atmosphere, Father Oribezi, never flagging, preached the tenets of the faith both day and night. He related to the Gnelts the history of the Old and New Testaments, the Apocalypse and the Epistles, 
then passed to the lives of the saints. He put particular fervor into the exalting of the Lord's martyrs. Poor man, that had always been his weakness. Mastering his emotions, Father Lassiman continued in a trembling voice. And so he spoke to them of St. John, who attained everlasting glory when they boiled him alive in oil, and of St. Agnes, who let her head be severed for the faith, and of St. Sebastian, pierced with many sorrows and suffering grievous torments, for which he was greeted in heaven by angels singing, and of the infant saints quartered, smothered, broken on the wheel, and roasted over a slow fire. All these agonies they accepted with joy, secure in the knowledge that they were thereby winning for themselves a place at the right hand of the Lord of hosts. And as he told them many similar lives, all worthy of emulation, the Gnelts, listening intently to his words, began to exchange significant looks, and the largest among them timidly spoke up. O reverend priest of ours, teacher and venerable father, tell us, please, if you would but deign to lower yourself to your most lowly servants, does the soul of any one willing to be martyred enter heaven? Assuredly so, my son, replied Father Oribezi. Yes, that is very good, said the Gnelt slowly. And you, O Father Confessor, do you too wish to enter heaven? To enter heaven is my fondest hope, my son. And to become a saint? the large Gnelt asked further. O worthy son, who is there who would not wish to become one? But such high honor is hardly for the likes of a sinner like myself. One must put forth all one's strength and strive unceasingly and in the greatest humility if one would enter on that path. Then you do wish to be a saint, repeated the Gnelt, to make sure, casting an affirmative look at his comrades who inconspicuously rose from their seats. Naturally, my son. Well, then, we will help you. And how will you do that, dear lambs? asked Father Oribezi with a smile for he was gladdened by the simple zeal of his faithful flock. In answer, the Gnelts gently but firmly took him by the arms and said, In the way, dear father, that you have just now taught us. Whereupon they pulled the skin from his back and rubbed the place with tar, as the executioner of Ireland did to St. Hyacinth. Then they chopped off his left leg, as the heathens did to St. Paphnus, after which they ripped open his stomach and put inside a clump of straw, as it happened to the blessed Elizabeth of Normandy, and next they impaled him as the Emilkites, St. Hugo, and broke his ribs as the Tyracusans, St. Henry of Padua, and roasted him over a slow fire as the Burgundians, the Maid of Orléans. Then finally they stepped back, washed their hands, and began shedding bitter tears for their lost shepherd. This was precisely how I found them, for in making the rounds of all the stars in my diocese, I dropped in on their parish. When I heard what had transpired, my hair stood on end. Wringing my hands, I cried, Shameless criminals, hell itself is not enough for you. Are you aware that you have damned your souls for all eternity? Yes, they sobbed, we are aware of this. That largest gnelt rose up and spoke to me thus. Reverend Father, we are well aware that we shall all be damned and tormented till the end of time, and we had to struggle mightily in our hearts before we took this resolve. But Father Oribezi told us repeatedly that there was nothing a good Christian would not do for his neighbor, that one should give up everything for him and be prepared to make any sacrifice. And so, with the greatest despair, we relinquished our salvation, thinking only of our dear Father Oribezi, that he would gain a martyr's crown and sainthood. I cannot tell you how difficult this was for us, for before Father Oribezi's arrival here, not one of us would have harmed a flea. Therefore we renewed our entreaties, we begged him on our knees to ease, to reduce a little the severity of the faith's commands, but he categorically maintained that for one's fellow man one should do everything, without exception. We were no longer able then to deny him. We reasoned, moreover, that we were beings of little significance and worth, beside this pious man, that he deserved the greatest self-denial on our part. Also, we fervently believe that our act was successful and that Father Oribezi now dwells in heaven. Here you have, Reverend Father, the sack with the money we collected for the canonization proceedings, as is required. Father Oribezi explained all that to us when asked. I must say that we used only his favorite tortures, those that he expounded to us with the most enthusiasm. We assumed that they would please him, and yet he resisted. In particular, he disliked swallowing the molten lead, However, we refused even to consider the possibility that that priest would tell us one thing and think another. 
The scream he uttered was only proof of the discontent of the lower physical parts of his person, and we ignored it in keeping with the teaching that one must mortify the flesh so that the spirit may soar higher. To sustain him, we reminded him of the principles he had preached to us, to which Father Orobesi answered but a single word, a word totally obscure and incomprehensible. We have no idea what it might mean, for we found it neither in the prayer books he had given us nor in the Holy Scriptures. Having concluded his tale, Father Lassimon wiped the beads of sweat from his brow, and we sat for a considerable while in silence. Moved with compassion, I placed a hand on the shoulder of the weary priest to give him an encouraging pat. At that very moment, something slipped out of my sleeve, gleamed, and clattered on the floor. Picture my astonishment and delight when I recognized, yes, my penknife. Apparently it had been in the lining of my jacket the whole time, 